if we look around the world at all the people eating all the food they eat, the human average for protein intake runs just around 10 to 11 percent. That's about what people eat. But it's cooked. Most of it's cooked. And when we cook any food, any whole food has protein in it. All foods, if you go back to your eighth grade biology, you know, this is a cell and there's DNA in the middle of the cell and Crick and Watson explained to us that the DNA, the double helix, and, and there's genetic material in there and, and, and that genetic material is made up of proteins. So in the center of a watermelon cell or a human cell or a blade of grass, it doesn't matter what it is, every cell has protein in its nucleus. So all foods have protein unless there's some refined thing like just straight refined sugar, straight refined oil. But whole foods all have protein and when you heat those proteins, we know what happens. What happens is that the protein strands themselves come apart. It's a, it's a type of denaturing. Now when we, when we eat our food and, and it goes through the digestive process, we also denature proteins. But this is a chemical denaturing and it's different than the it's totally different than the denaturing that happens when we expose proteins to heat. When we so digestively, we break the protein into smaller parts. When we do it through heat, the bonds that are holding the proteins together literally come apart, but when they cool, they come back together. Except they don't come back to where they were. They come back together almost in a random pattern. They come back what's called cross-linked. The cross-linked proteins in and of themselves are not so bad other than they're not anything that we recognize. Our body does not recognize it. And so we do what we do with all foreign invaders. We attack it. Okay, we attack it with our white blood cells. But the cross-linked proteins have a unique quality which is known as enzyme resistance. And we break our proteins down through the function of various enzymes. And when the cross-linked proteins become enzyme resistant, or which are enzyme resistant, we eat those, we now have no way to break those proteins down into their component parts, which are the amino acids that we can then utilize. So we are eating perhaps 10 or 11 percent of our total calories as protein, but we're not accessing it because it was enzyme resistant. <laughs> That's what I think too. At this point, and different arguments could be made in different ways, but we can look at a child, especially an infant, who goes through the fastest growth spurt known to humans. They're consuming strictly and only mother's milk, 6% of the calories coming from protein. And go, ah, oh, well, if a baby can grow on 6% protein, and the only growth I'm doing is just repair and maintenance, I and mean, I'm not getting bigger, I don't, how much protein could I possibly need? And we look at the human average of 10% consumption, realizing that most of that is heated to the point of inaccessibility. And then we look at the reality of the fact that there is no known medical condition known as protein deficiency. 
I mean, if you don't have enough vitamin C, it's called scurvy. You know, if you don't have enough B vitamin, it's, it's either rickets or any of the different B vitamin deficiency diseases. Um, and if you don't get enough iron, well, we'll talk about it, you know, are you getting enough tomorrow? But if you don't get enough iron, you know, you've got iron deficiency anemia. But there is no medical condition for not enough protein. There was a long time ago a, an idea that if you didn't have enough protein, uh, you, would, you would have a condition called kwashiorkor. We may have seen the, the babies in Ethiopia, you know, with the stomach where they've started to consume their own stomach musculature. So now there's just skin holding in their organs and it's bulging as if they'd had a big meal, but actually they haven't had anything to eat. They're eating themselves. It was eventually discovered that kwashiorkor uh, was not a protein deficiency, it was a calorie deficiency. And if you just gave these people food, they recovered. The, if you don't have enough food and you get some of these symptoms, uh, this is called marasmus. Not a common problem in the UK. Okay, It's not something we're worrying about, not getting enough food to the point of, of marasmus. But kwashiorkor was actually dropped from the medical dictionaries because it didn't exist. It was mythical. It's been brought back. Uh, it's been brought back, and, and you can now find a combination of the two terms in what is known as marismatic kwashiorkor. If you don't get enough to eat, you may experience a protein deficiency among the other problems that you're going to have. But if we don't have protein deficiency, and the average person's consuming 10%, but it's cooked most of it, and so they're really only getting a small percentage of what they consume anyway, and babies are only getting 6% in the first place, how much do we really need of protein? I felt on relatively safe ground to make a recommendation of 10% maximum. And people still get excited, more so in the States than anywhere in the world. There's a really, like, they have a neurosis thing about protein. Uh, they don't like to say cow or pig. They like to say protein. Okay. <clears throat> Even though cows and pigs are mostly fat, I mean, like, like, there's a, an awareness of nutrition that has grown dramatically over the last few decades to the point where the common man knows a lot more about nutrition than he really should because he knows a bunch of the details without the overriding concepts. <clears throat> 